The Effenrad Snowboard Podcast is presented by Vans. Season 8 of Effenrad is sponsored by Wired Snowboards, Anon Optics, The Boardroom Snowboard Shop, Find an EpicAgent.com, and Tribute Board Shop in Nelson, BC. Anon Optics are the best goggles money can buy, so you should go to your local Anon dealer and get yourself a pair today. Anon goggles fit your face, don't fog up, and have an amazing variety of lens tints for the different conditions you'll encounter out there in the mountains. My favorite Anon feature is the quick change magnetic lens system because I ride a lot in changing light conditions and the ability to change lenses on the fly guarantees that I'm always riding with the best visibility possible. Magnetic face mask integration provides seamless face mask attachment and full perimeter vents maintain consistent airflow for fog-free clarity. Find Anon at your local snowboard shop. Support also comes from Dekine, Grouse Mountain, Mount Seymour, Pro Standard GoPro Accessories, and Volcom Outerwear. Also, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. I really hate begging, but this is important. Please, please, please subscribe. Special thanks this episode to Beneath, Y East Academy, High Cascade Snowboard Camp, This Place is Awesome, and Tomahawk Indigenous Products. Tim Wendell was a world champion freestyler and racer from the 80s era. After attending Jose Fernandez Camp in Austria in 85 with Craig Kelly, Tim and Craig set up the Canada Snowboard Camp that eventually turned into Craig Kelly's World Snowboard Camp. Wendell moved down to Mount Hood to start Wendell's snowboard camp, which has operated continually since the summer of 1987. Most features you've seen or ridden were conceived, tried, tested, and improved at Wendell's or High Cascade at Mount Hood in the summer. Their rivalry pushed the progression of halfpipe, jump, and feature building for three decades before they merged just a couple years ago. You'll hear that story and more in this week's episode of F and Rad. We had Fred Meyer's old home there, which was a, a lodge, his lodge. Fred Meyer from the the, the, the rest or the uh, the grocery store slash buy whatever you need chain. <laughs> <Fred Meyer. laughs> yeah, that Fred Meyer, and uh, that's where we started camp. Well, we didn't start camp. The camp had already been going, but that's what that was like uh, the beginning of. What I would consider the legacy of uh, the Wendell's brand, anyway. Because yeah, yeah. that lodge was tucked away. It was unique. You could focus on everybody. There was no real outside distractions other than what we created. And You had the checker pig bikes there mm -hmm. So and a trampoline. Small ramp, maybe? Maybe no ramp when I was there. Yeah, when it was three ninety nine. No, we had, a, we had a ramp. We had a... Like, a, like probably a six foot or something? Four we had a four. hip ramp there. Oh, shit. That, what's his name? Uh, what is that guy's name? He was a skater and pro snowboarder. No Slaznik just destroyed. Uh, yeah, of just, course. Destroyed of course. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As well as Harper is good at it. You know, there's a couple guys from AZP. I can't remember all their names, but yeah, they were really good as well. Yeah, that, that brand, Checker Pig, like it's kind of like Crazy Banana or something where like as a consumer you knew – this isn't going to be Burton. That's how it felt. Right. Yeah. But you, you had fucking Kevin Young repping Checker Pig, Lisa Venturiera. Yeah, yeah. You were on there. It was like, well, maybe, maybe this could work. Yeah. And then when we got to camp, the bikes, I, I remember they were mountain bikes before mountain bikes actually like were everywhere. They were insane. They were insane. They were like, maybe they had full suspension or something. They had like full 91. suspension. We had both. We had both full suspension and non-full suspension. And those bikes over in Europe at that point in time, you know, the equivalent in the American dollar was like $8,000 <laughs> on up to like 12. And I think we had like 25 or 30. Of them. It was a full fleet. Yeah. <laughs> that was like, so I met a lifetime friend there, uh, Steve. We got, we got, you know how you do the sorting it on the first day. Yeah, yeah. We both got into the beginner group, even though we could do backflips and we thought we were the best. Yeah, yeah. And we were both bitter. We were both like, fuck this, man. Like, we should be in the expert group. We should be riding with the pros. And then you get to the, to the pipe and it's like, well, you are riding with the pros. It doesn't matter what one you're in. Right. But we rode those bikes everywhere, like into town. 
in the bushes there it was so dope that was that's what i remember about camp was like fucking mountain biking is awesome <laughs> yeah it's fun super fun and the glacier was just well everything about mount hood the, the approach to the mountain bunch of kids in a bus pappas picked us up at the airport in a van with a mattress in the back that's what kind of days it was <laughs> oh that's funny i wonder if that was my van it was i believe people the, were like that was tim's van yeah i'm yeah. pretty sure that was my van why the mattress because i sleep in the van <laughs> unbelievable unbelievable i mean that's why i travel in the winter time and you know is uh i had stipends to stay at places but i i like sleeping i'm fine sleeping outside content content yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's sick. And I like getting away from things so that I could focus, you know? I and got that's, you. that's a big thing with me. So let's go back to the beginning. Like, what's the first... I can't even imagine, you know, when and where you see your first snowboard. Probably in Boulder. No, I saw my first snowboard up here on Mount Hood. And uh, there was this guy uh, that I didn't know. And I think it was, you know, what year was that? It was probably... I think it was 80. And I was going to school in Newport, Oregon. Okay. And so I hopped on a church trip. I'm, I'm not religious, just to let you know. Um, I, I, I think there's a spirit. Out, we're not going to go too deep in that. But I think there's a spirit out there. Uh, and it's... I I don't see it in a in the light of what everybody else says. If I've, I was, met, I've met it on on a heavy dose of, of dimethyltryptamine. I've I've met this spirit, this energy. <laughs> there you I, go. It's undeniable. It's in everything. Yeah, uh, it's yeah, in everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and well, it's not a it's not a single lonely gray beard man up in the sky with no woman counterpart and no friends. Yeah, and yeah. an apple <laughs> and an apple and <laughs> whatever <a> snaky devil. <laughs> no, it's way weirder than that. It's way weirder than that. Yeah, I mean, if I were to equate it with anything, it'd be Buddhism. But let's carry sure. on. Yes. So I uh, hopped on a church trip up here because paid cut, paid five dollars for a bus ride from Newport, Oregon, up to Mount Hood. Sick. And then they put you up in a, a discounted hotel lodge, which was uh, amazing, like the Boy Scout lodge. Was, I think it was dollar ninety five a night for us to stay, which was really cheap. And and so I did that. And so I, I watched this guy go down the slopes, and I was just like, holy cow! And he was slashing the sides of of, of the runs. And I was in nineteen eighty. Yeah, 1980-81. Yeah. And I was just like, yes. Cool. This is what I want. So I chased that guy down on my skis, and it was, lo and behold, it was Rob Morrow. Of course. Okay. Yes. And uh, and so I went and asked him, say, can I trace this out on cardboard? And I traced it out on cardboard. Wow. His, his board and uh, a bunch of, you know, probably Budweiser cardboard boxes <laughs> and and took it down to my shop i was i, I was doing a lot of wood shop and and because i grew up in so boulder rad. we'd our education system in boulder colorado was a, a lot more advanced than newport oregon so i pretty much did all my prerequisites and so i was just taking wood shop oh my god that's awesome. so i built out like five snowboards come on yeah yeah, yeah. i still have one to this day oh wow and uh and so yeah i built out that and that was pretty much when i started what board was it that you traced? I don't even know. I think it was like just a blank board. Like so he had probably traced he had something. he had like rubber bindings on them, you know. Wow. So you put your thing in the rubber, as yeah. I as I recall, and it had scags on it. And oh wow! It, it wasn't a Burton. I don't know if it was a Sims. I doubt it was a Sims. I don't think it had any brand name. And you know, because Rob was here on the West Coast, it was either a Barfoot or a Sims, more than likely. More than likely. Yeah. 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 Or a tracing of it. Because lots of guys rode traced boards. Lots. Like yeah. Regis Roland bought uh bought uh, Dimitri's board from him when Dimitri came and visited, broke it and then traced it and several traced boards just make 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 it up <laughs> well at the time there were what like nine ply so you just you you get a press you you get yeah, it's a, like a skateboard yeah and you just make it like a skateboard and and it probably worked just as well as a production board anyways how back, back yeah then. how long did you how long did you ride the boards that you made for so i rode those boards probably on and off for four years for and, and would that be out here or would it be here and, and, and Colorado? Because I lived in Newport and yeah. I didn't have a car. Yeah. I, it was hard for me to get up to the mountain. So I rode a few times out here, you know, not much on those. Yeah. But when I got to Colorado, uh, I definitely rode them. So yeah. I rode them up at the pass uh, and, and then uh, and then went to Durango, Colorado. And Durango has a ski area right in town. Sick. And yeah. so I would, you know, as much as I could. I'd yeah. carry it up to school and 
you know, snowboard, snowboard down because the ski area, yeah. the little ski hill is right there on the side of the mountain. And so that was pretty much where it was. And then we went up to the passes out there in uh, Durango, which is cold belt and Camolas Pass and rode quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. The passes, it makes sense. Like I went up over into a basin and I forget what that pass is called, but uh, it, it's tall. It's, it's a yeah, it's Loveland Pass. Loveland, right. Yeah, yeah so I'd ride Loveland Pass. And the, uh, the really popular pass back then was the one that goes over into uh, Winter Park as well because yeah. it was closer to, to Boulder and closer to Golden and all those places. And I can't remember the name of that pass. And people would come up, like like Jake would come up. Yeah, right? oh, yeah. Jake and Tom. Tom would come up. Yep. Yeah, you'd he, see, yeah. uh, you know, Tom's uh, sidekicks, Weaver. Um, <laughs> you know, you had, uh, I mean, I don't know if Chuck ever came out, but I'm sure he did. Yeah, probably, right? Yeah. Yeah, he said that that they would make a board. They'd be so excited. They'd just figure out where it snowed in the last few days and then just, like, drive 17 hours <laughs> and, and then just, like, you know, take some turns. Oh, that board's so awesome. Back in the car, back home. Yeah. Like, it's that's nuts. Th- those passes are, are, like, the perfect place for they snowboarding to, like – for progression to happen outside of resorts, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And most resorts back then didn't allow you to ride anyway. So. Right, right. And actually, Loveland Pass had lifts at some point, right? Well, there's Loveland Ski Area at the bottom of it. Yeah. And, and so yeah. they do have lifts there. They still have them. Yeah, they still have them. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was just blown away by Colorado. It's so different from Utah or California or BC, where I'm from. Um the mountains are gorgeous. Yeah. It's a whole different vibe of mountain people. Yeah, it's, uh, it is it is quite a bit different than Canada and California and Utah. Right? I totally agree. And even Oregon, right? Oh, yeah. 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 Oregon's the most like Canada to me. The yeah, people, it's chill. It's so mellow. chill. Yeah. People yeah. are very, you know, call your drop in and, and you're. I've never seen any animosity at Hood. It, it's just like a big festival of snowboarding all the time yeah people sleeping in their cars in the parking lot and wow, they're sleeping in tents in the woods <laughs> yeah, for the whole totally. summer <laughs> unfreaking believable so when do you get on sim sims would be the first hookup i'd imagine right yeah sim snowboards was my first hookup and there was a contest up at wolf creek pass Sweet. um and i want to say that was 86 ish maybe 87 okay. yeah and uh and so, you know, this guy, Jeff Gorell, who invented the high back, said, hey, Tim, you should try this board out. And I tried the board out, yeah. took a run on it. He's like, you should enter this contest. And I'm like, I got no money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would love to, but I got no money. My friends are like, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll pitch in and we'll, we'll, we'll take it. And if you do win anything, just give it to us. And so I entered the contest and won it. No way. And so that was in the parking lot. Tom gave me a contract and said, hey. You know, this contract doesn't state this, but, uh, you, you know, you sign this contract, you're going to go to Europe for a month and a half and go compete. Holy shit. You know? Yeah. And, and travel all over. I'm like, like, where am I going to travel? He's like, oh, you're going to go to, you know, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, Italy, you know, France. And I'm like, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm How mad. old are you at this point? I was probably, I was in college, so I was probably 21, 22. Like, what an opportunity. Yeah. Oh, it was insane. Like, and, and Tom, by all accounts... Like if you were, you know, if you were on his good side, if you were part of his team, mm-hmm. he took care of you. Like he, he, he was you. into it. He, yeah. he took care of me. You know, his, his highlight uh, was Craig, of, of course. Yes. And then when Craig and those guys had their split, then it was, it was Palmer, yep. you know, and, and it, I mean, rightfully so. Those guys have, you know, Craig's incredible yeah. in all facets of life. Yeah, and, and Palmer just has a source of energy and badassness that not many people have. There's only one Palmer. There's only one, There's Palmer. Only one Palmer. And it's incredible what that guy could create and can do, you know, uh, with all odds against him. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And often, often self inflicted <laughs> odds <laughs> against him. Totally, so, so, totally. but yeah. I learned through the podcast that there was a point where, Tom was kicking Jake's ass. Like oh, before yeah. before Craig switched over, Tom was kicking ass like so hard. Like those FE fifteen hundreds, the FE series boards, yeah, were like rideable boards 
The very first. For the masses. Yeah, the very first. They were friendly ride of the boards for the, for the masses. Yeah, they worked. Yeah, and I mean, Tom, before that, I mean, he just didn't have the freestyle guy. And, you know, that person ended up being Craig. Yes. And then that advancement of going through Craig and then on to uh, Turier, you know, and it was just like, you know, that's when he started really getting, I mean, with Craig, Craig's first board, that was the beginning of it. And then it just yeah. kept going. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I've talked with Brad Stewart about it. At the time, Craig was standing out for sure. I mean, I guess if you knew him, you could see his work ethic was like way up here. But you guys went on that European trip together, and the fucking Sims team was so stacked. Yeah. Like, to be the top-tier pro on Sims at that time was to be the best in the world, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And And Brad was in, you know, we got young Todd Richards... I can't even start naming the people that are on there at that time because it's half the industry, right? It's the freestyle half of the industry. Yes, yes. That's pretty much the way I would look at it. Yeah. I mean, and it was stacked. I mean, you had, you had, it was, you, had, you know, you had Craig, you had, you had uh, Palmer, you had Kidwell. I think you had Scott Downey over there yep. as well. Um yeah, you had Todd Richards. You had what, what was the other guy's name that is sailing all over the world? Mike Jacoby. Mike he Jacoby. was on there. That's right. Yeah, Jacoby. And then even in Europe, you had Jose Fernandez. I mean, you had <laughs> these iconic people, and you're just like, wow. And Sims himself was so in love with snowboarding. I mean, he was a skater at heart, but but he he loved that this was kind of a second chance. This is my guess. For him to actually like make a bunch of cash and be the number one thing in a, you know, growing sport. He'd seen it happen in, in skateboarding and he'd, he'd reached for the ring and just missed it, got beat out by Dorfman or whoever. And yeah, I wonder if it was reaching out to the cash. I found Tom to be the passionate person that loved the sport and just wanted for the betterment of the sport. I'm so he happy to hear that. He wanted, he wanted something better. For yeah, everybody. Yeah, he liked the progression. He liked the progression. That's why he had such a stacked team is that he would go around. I've heard this story about 10 times. Tom gave me his board, right? Like he'd go somewhere yeah. and he'd see somebody ripping and he'd be like, try it on my board. Yeah. And then the person would be like, this is insane. And he'd be like, keep it. Yeah. And that's how people got their boards, yeah. you know, and got on the, on the Sims team was that genuine passion. I'm sure Jake did it too. I'm, I'm sure he gave away boards. I know Craig did. Oh, Jake, Jake gave away boards and he let, he let his teams, you know, some of his key team people do that. So yeah, yeah. Jake was a good dude too. Yes. Yeah. I did, mean, did you see that movie? Did you see the, the I yeah. have not watched it yet. Oh my God. You yeah. Gotta watch it. You're, yeah. you're going to. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I it's, have to. It's heavy. We were yeah. talking about Jake the other day <laughs> on a raft trip. I took my board of directors down and, and we have a bunch of old people from the snowboard industry on the board of directors, and it was pretty interesting just talking about stuff there. That's um, But, yeah, you know, I never uh, – Tom did live in Malibu, California, but I never saw money being his deal. Okay. That's dope. That's good. Check this shit out. I, got, I just have to show you this because you've shot with Bud. We just left Bud's, Bud Fawcett's house uh, a couple of days ago. Yeah, and I'm while not. he was there, he's like, I got this picture of Jake. I'm going to just zoom in on the picture here flying off a cornice but i don't know if uh, he's like i don't know if it's good enough he you know because bud yeah see i, I was think... the same like the sideways thing it looks like he had turned it sideways but i've never seen jake that high up in the air i said fuck you've got to print that you got to put that out there that's you know proof that jake was freestyling at his prime like dude he's sending a cornice there that's, that's pretty yeah, it's respectable yes. for that time, right? Oh, for sure for yeah. that time. Yeah. Definitely. Because he was more the business guy. If you're if I'm gonna claim somebody was more on the business side, you know, between Jake and Tom, it's it's definitely Jake. Oh, I'm sure. I mean, Jake was brilliant in his way, and you you could watch it as somebody was traveling all over the country and really the world is like how Jake expanded, you know? Mm. He expanded his business for the Midwest and the East Coast, and Tom was West Coast, you know, in the Rocky Mountains. Right, right. Slowly. And right. The, the population on the Midwest back East is far greater. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think it was, is it Scott Clum that was kind of the lone East Coast guy? Riding the <laughs> riding the Sims, riding the Sims, getting shots with Trevor Graves, yeah, yeah, and, and then eventually they got to come out west, probably. I mean, 
Yeah. They did. I mean, that's who I was with on the flow trip talking about Jake the other oh, day. Oh, come on. Oh, that's so sick. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, of course, because he's a part of We Are Camp. Yep. yep right? Yep. That, yeah. That's super sick. So Sims is, you win a lot of shit while you're on Sims. Like, you become one of the most recognized riders of that era. Yeah, I, I did really well, you know? I, you know, uh, there was tons of co- events back then, you know, and, right. and when the sports knew, so I, they would run me over to Australia, you know, South America, wow. New Zealand, Japan, and Japan just kept bringing me back and back and back in <laughs> Europe and stuff like that. And so I think, you know, I was looking at my resume that I was passing out in like 91, I think it was, and I won like 141, you know, <laughs> events, oh my first places. God. And again, the vast majority of those, like the lion's share of those were just one-offs, you know, like sure. Australia pay, pay Craig and I to go down to Australia and go compete in one of their events. They would pay us, they pay for our airline flight, they pay for our hotel, our food, our lift tickets, everything, and then hand one of us all the money. So it was like, it was either it was either Craig or me, and I'll have to say it was always me, because um, <laughs> of course. <laughs> and, and so you know, those are just like that's a one off, you know, and that's a yeah. big trip because it's Hell, a yeah. it's a flight. Yeah, yeah. But but who cares? I mean, that's it's amazing. so fun, and those people are so amazing. So you're tight with Craig all through the Sims days for sure. Yeah, and even when he was on Burton, for yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it wasn't. I don't think we ever weren't tight. Cool. You know, and I mean, how do you defining tight is right. all relative to everybody in retrospect. Right. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, we, we traveled a lot together. We were voted by the North American writers, uh, um, meaning Canada and the United States to represent them in developing out the world cup series and ensuring wow. that the rules and regulations that govern those series were there for the writers, you know? Right. And that's what, that was like the biggest thing that, uh, you know, Kevin Kinnear was pushing and Kevin Kinnear's buddy that ran the windsurfing uh, competitions. Like, it's about the riders. Don't give up the riders. Uh, you know, uh, don't give up the riders. You know, uh, what am I looking for? Input, like voice. Yeah, input. Yeah, they yeah. have to have full input on what's going on. And that's how surfing is and yada, right. yada, yada. It really, that's what, that was the big fault of the Olympics was that it was the other side. It was like, who gives a shit about the riders? This is a money making event. We're taking it. We're taking the most popular sport in the world and we're putting it in front of everybody. And we can't just leave that to these riders. We need to. We, we, we're, the IOC is going to govern it and, exactly. and crush it and exactly. kill it. And that's exactly what we were looking to get, get, get away from. Yes. You know, and, and like, you know, my philosophy is because I went to uh, the first Olympics of mogul skiing and, uh, and then freestyle skiing, which is the aerials. You went to the very first one. Well, no, I went to the yeah the very first one when they introduced those. That's and, fucking crazy. And watch those sports yeah. die. Yes. And so yes. that that was uh we started in ninety eight in Nagano, so that was ninety four. Yeah. And I was like, the Olympics are where sports go to die. Yes. And that's exactly what it is. That's unbelievable. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and that's what I was preaching to everybody. You know. Yeah. yeah. Even the skiers when the skiers were getting into it, they're like, you know, the ski thing is like. And they were, they were, they had me come to a lot of their meetings and they're like, you know, Hey, once we go into the Olympics, this free skiing movement's going to blow up for the next six to eight years. I'm like, (laughs) uh, now obviously uh, it's going to die. That's nuts. It's like going to die. And that's what it did. Yeah. hundred percent. Skiing went in. It was, it was going great guns and it's freaking dead. That's nuts. And, and, you know, that's like going, going back into like, just to explain it, it's like, you know, I, I just said I had, I had 141 first places. It's yeah. like all those small little competitions that go on that kind of feed the sport, get it out in front of people. It's fun for everybody. And people could be a part of this thing yeah. on, a, on a smaller scale. You know, those all go away because the next thing that's available is like the Olympics. Right. So if you got big sponsors that are going to come under and do like the do tours and, you know, right. even the X Games is like they struggle because they're like, well, you guys aren't the Olympics. Right. Right. You know? Well, that's what happened. It split the competition into, well, are you going to go to the Olympics or are you going to stay supporting the community? Right. And the community one felt like the right thing to do. I don't think there was anybody that was like, yeah, 
well, maybe Jacoby, he wanted to go to the Olympics pretty bad. You know, he wanted it to there, be legit. There, there's there was, quite a, yeah, there was a split, of course. There were people that were like, this is legitimizing our sport. There was a lot of hope. It's right. Like, you know, right. and that's what humans kind of feed off of is hope. You yes. know, and you're like, yeah. oh, this is so great. We've been working to get to the Olympics for so long. And, you know, you could go, you could go ex- try to explain to somebody that's so passionate about what they're doing and stuff. And yeah, unfortunately, you got to see it, feel it to understand it. So, what year? You guys are in Austria when you come up with the camp idea. And I, I, in my mind, the way you told me was like, you and Craig were like, we could do one of these in North America. Like there was already established. Yeah. So we went to camp. Jose Fernandez's camp in Stubai, Stubaital, Austria. Sick. And we wanted to start the freestyle side of it. So it was me, Craig, and I feel like Carrie Hanyon was there and Lori Gibbs. Rad. Um, and of course, Jose and a whole bunch of Europeans, Evelyn, yeah. Evelyn Vuelme and Evelyn Worth. I mean, Evelyn Vuelme was really good. Worth was good too. Um, and so we, we, we were in Austria trying to, you know, say, Hey, we want to build a half pipe, which we've never built a half pipe. Right. You know, we know what skate half pipes look like. And we were just, we were just, uh, let's just say ignorant enough to <laughs> go out there and try to not only not, we didn't know, not only know how to build a half pipe, the cat driver there didn't know. And no he didn't idea. speak a lick of English. Oh, wow. So he speaks Swiss German. We didn't speak a lick of Swiss German. <laughs> and so it was just kind of a junk show. Yeah. And which is fine. And it was a great learning experience for us. And we had a really good time. We were able to build some highway jumps, you know? Nice. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Tombstones to, uh, with a landing. Yeah, which you could learn a lot back then, especially, you know, which was fun. Um, but when we're flying back to North America, we're like, we got to bring this to North America. Cool. And Blackholm was opening up uh, the Horseman Glacier yep. uh, the next summer. And so we're like, you know, this is, uh, it was 87 when we were at, did the Jose Fernandez camp. And then uh, this was, no, was it 87 or 86? So we did two years up at Horseman Glacier. So it was 86, I guess. Wow. And, and then, so it was 87. We were doing, uh, we, 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 uh, found a guy in, Oh, Craig actually knew the guy that owns a bike shop down in downtown BC, Vancouver. Right. And he took care of all of our registrations and Damn. the insurance side of things and all the stuff that we had no clue. Right. About. We're professional <laughs> snowboarders. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, yeah, so we ran camp up at, uh, up in Black Elm. How do you get campers? Like, how would people know to go to the camp? No, that's a good question. So I don't recall if we put advertisements out. I feel like what it was is like networking. Craig and I were traveling, you know, right. all the time. Right. Is like pushing out information that way. Yeah. And yeah. those camps, those first camps were pretty small. Yeah. And the idea behind those camps were invite some of the top pros out there so that we could actually help elevate the sport, you cool. know? Cool. And, and of course, ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. That was the thing that uh, the, the functionality of the camp as a continuation of training for you and Craig, where it's like, we're going to win everything. Everybody's taking the summers off. They've gone windsurfing that we can progress over the summer and first competition freestyle. Like nobody's going to even be able to touch us. And, and there's a big reason for that. Cause no ski area in North America, Europe, Japan, anywhere in the freaking world had a half pipe. Right. And, and so we had these competitions that were half pipe competitions that so we'd, rad. we'd show up to, you know, and the half pipe would be available to ride like that day of the half pipe That's in many it. cases. Yes. Even in World Cups or, yeah. you know, and, and are the day before in World Championship. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You t- I talked to Tucker Franson and he was like, oh, fuck, I won the half pipe contest. I didn't even go to the award ceremony. I didn't even know until after people were coming out going like, dude, you won, you won. He's like, it was the day, the only day I got to ride the pipe. Right. So like I was there from as soon as it opened until they kicked me out. Like, the, uh, what are you going to do? There's not going to be a half pipe tomorrow. Well, I don't want to sit in there and I, I don't care that I won. I care <laughs> about riding this fucking half pipe. I care about riding, <laughs> which is what we cared about. And so yes. I saw... And Craig Kelly saw is like, we could start building out, we could have these camps. We could go to two weeks, build out pipes and stuff like that. Yeah. And that was great. 
Now the the big issue there, and and what it did is what you know I I invited everybody from Japan, all the media sources, Rad. you know America, North America, and even Europe, and so they started coming out and snapping photos, and yeah. then that was the big push for the next year. You That's know? it, yeah. And then I was like, you know, the second year up at Whistler, as we had we had more people, which yeah. was great, yeah, uh, which was a lot more responsibility. Um, but the biggest problem we had is we had this deal called uh, Saturday morning and Sunday morning, and the staff wouldn't show up because they're out partying like rock stars <laughs> till five o'clock in the morning. Right. We didn't have cell phones back then, right? So you couldn't track them down. Of course, and they're not staying in their place where they're supposed to. They're staying with women <laughs> or whatever, you know. Yep, yep. <laughs> Could be sleeping on the side <laughs> of a sidewalk or something. Yeah. And I was just like, I can't keep doing this. I want to be more serious about it. And yeah. So Craig, I'm going to split. And I'm going to go down to Hood. And so I went down to Hood that same year, built a pipe up, invited all the top Europeans over, top Japanese, and many of the top Americans. So you left like the Tim and Craig camp. What was it called? So as I recall, that camp was called the Canadian Snowboard Association. <laughs> wow. Camp. The, uh, two Americans running at the Canadian Association. I'm pretty sure that's, that's the way it was called for yeah. insurance purposes in order to, yeah. in order to, uh, you know, uh, satisfy Black Home. And Black Home, they were great. Yeah. I, they were super good to work with. That's right. And it was a challenging situation there. But, it, you know, the big thing there is if you want to take up rails and boxes, you can run them on a cap and you had to pay a fee. Timberline, you didn't have to pay a fee. You know, if you wanted to take a whole bunch of boxes and rails up there, you, you had to, you could loop them onto a helicopter and oh, helicopter wow. them up there. Right. You know, and you not right. only have to helicopter them up there, you got to helicopter them off. Yeah. Up at Hood, it's all free. Yeah. And so I yeah. was like, I'm going to hire people within the skateboard realm, the, snow, the snowboard slash skateboard realm, which is the, the Arizona Posse. Yeah. AZP. Yeah. You know, and, and get those guys up there. And we're going to start building out things. And we'll just become the incubator of what is possible. What can snowboarding do and see what happens? So was your camp the first snowboard camp up there or was Chris Carroll up there? Or? Chris Carroll was up there and, and USSTC were USSTC were already up there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, those were attracting kids from across uh, America. Yeah. At, that at that point in time, Carroll had the biggest camp. Yeah. By far. Right, right. I mean, I don't remember how many campers he had, but I wouldn't be surprised if he had 110. Are you shitting me? No. At that, that time? Uh, yeah, at that time. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. You know, and, and it was really interesting to me is, you know, I followed Chris Carroll's camp because I, I would go down there and I, I admire Chris even to this day. Same. Um, and he, you know, I admire him even though he, he whooped my ass in a fit that I was supposed to win. And he crushed me, <laughs> crushed me. And I was just No like, animosity there, I guess. <laughs> no, no, he totally crushed me. Oh, and wow. I deserve to be crushed, I guess, is what it was. <laughs> it doesn't feel good, but sometimes it lights a fire in your ass. Yeah, um, yeah. Anyway, I would go down there and I'd just listen to the discontent in his staff. Okay. Okay. Like yeah. huge discontent. He had people like Andy Coggin in there yep. and a whole bunch of other people that are just, you know, they're just down on the whole thing. And Chris would be MIA. And I was like, okay, he's going to go away. His camp's not going to last. You he's could, either could, not into it. feel the descent. <clears throat> yeah. 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 He's either not into it. Yeah. And are, you know, he's just done with it. Right. You know, right. and he's it, burnt out. And I was like, he's probably done with it. So I'm going to go all in. And so that's what I did. I just went all in. Yeah. And it was the best thing I ever did. What year is that around? Is that when that I was 88? That? Well, 88, I did. Yeah. I did one session. 89, I was all in. I yeah. it was like, okay, here's, here's my goal in 88, you know, is I'm going to go up. I'm going to get a, get a, I'm going to build a pipe. I'm going to invite all the top pros over in, in, in the world. And we're going to go and we're going to fucking advance this sport. Sick. And that Sick. was pretty much it. I think that Timberline advanced freestyle way more than Whistler Black Home. And I mean, I'm Canadian, so I should be uh, all Black they, Home. But they it's, let it just us was, do whatever they yeah, want. RLK, who's running that place. Yeah. I would go in and just praise him. Go, dude. This is going to be a legacy of this place, right? Just let us do what right. we're doing, and if we fuck up, yeah, then let's let's talk about it and take care of it, yeah, yeah. immediately. Let's not throw it under the rug and let it percolate right. and boil. Right. Right. So I, when something bad would happen, I'd go to our okay and just go, dude. We had we had a pretty big injury today, yeah. 
and it's serious, you know, and it was three, three Canadians knocking himself out on the same gap jump. Oh my God. <laughs> He's like, what well, do you think yeah. we shouldn't do gap jumps anymore? I'm like, oh no, no. I think we could do them better. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we yeah, can build, yeah, we, we can yeah. definitely build them better. Yeah. So I just want to let you know, but honest to God, I mean, we built this like 70 foot gap jump. Oh wow. And Sean Johnson, boom, knocks himself out. Oh, um, Sheen Campus, boom, <laughs> knocks himself out. No. And I forget the other one, Kearns, maybe it was. Yeah, I, I don't know if it was Kearns or not. Knocked himself out, and I was just like, "Holy guys, shit!" Yeah. You think after one guy would go off and knock himself out, you guys would pay attention? Oh, wow. But yet, all three of you guys go. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm watching it from afar, and Going, I'm just like, "Oh man!" Hell? Yeah. At what point do you take take a step away from competitions? And have to, is it like camp becomes a full-time job and, and you step away or is it the, yeah, like what happens there? You know, it was funny because I remember uh, Brad Dorfman tried to get me to take over. Brad Stewart was leaving Sims and Dorfman was like, Tim, I want you to take it over. Wow. And so he gave me, he offered me a bunch of, he offered a really good deal. I mean, better yeah. deal than, I mean, it took me probably 25 years later to make as much money as he was offering me. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> From a salary standpoint of view. Absolutely. Um, and, uh, and I, you know, I turned him down three times and, and then I was, you know, and thankfully, because then he folded, you know, I yeah. would have, I would have moved out there and then would have been done. Yeah. Um, yeah. Things were quite volatile in those days, right? 91. Well, yeah. 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 Well, so that's your checker pig at that point. And when you came into the demo, you know, we we're really excited for a world champion guy to come there and, you know, at the time, there wasn't that big of a stretch between the guy who's the enthusiast that rides every day and the world champions, because it's not like you're doing quad corks or something. You're doing hand plants, which a lot of people can't do because that that takes a lot of skill. And they're styly as fuck. They're fun. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've never done one. I've, I've done a couple cheaty ones. But right. yeah. Right. Yeah. By the checker pig time, it's like you're not flying around the world winning you know, world cups anymore. I was picking, picking and choosing events. Right. And vast majority of those were over in Japan. Were you burned out <clears> on <throat> the travel of it? Like, did you want to just settle down and do, or was it like, like I said, again, like camp was just, it was exponential growth every year. And then you could raise the prices and you're managing a hundred people. And no, I've been working with the future of the snowboard industry, you know, and, and right. leading up to that, like 89, 90, 91. I mean, who's coming through the pipeline? Turier. Uh -huh. He, the guy, you know, he, he, he would blow us all away in warm up runs and then he would fucking choke in the event. It was like, start working with him go ahead dude you could do this yeah here's what's going on yeah because you know back then there was no coaching right. and if nobody's right. explaining to you you might understand there's an issue yeah or you might not you might right. be oblivious to it so then right. i was just telling him was like hey you know this look at this so you, you run know? into that coach role i could see that happening for craig too because craig leaving competition the board with the world era and going and free riding around the world it took everybody you know everybody was shocked by it but it kind of makes sense if you're at camp and you're seeing what's coming down the pike and you're like, well, I'm not doing that. I'm like, never going to do that. That's not happening. I can't do it. Yeah, I, Every generation <clears throat> faces that. Every generation. Exactly. Yeah. So you're kind of waning your way out. I yeah. kept competing up to 95. Okay. Cool. So, but again, I was more behind the scenes. I wasn't Picking doing and choosing your contest. Like, hey, I might win twenty grand at this thing. I, I might I'm, win a car. I might win a car. I'm going to this <laughs> yeah. for sure. Yeah, because my riding ability wasn't. I was still. I would consider myself still a really good rider at that point in time. Yeah, but I was nowhere near to the abilities of, you know. I mean, so many of those guys, but I'll just name Turier. Yeah. I mean, there's yeah. no possible way. I He's can... the era defining competitive snowboarder. Yeah. He was unbeatable. Unbeatable. And like, so like someone like Todd Richards who beats him remembers that for the rest of their life. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Like. And Richards too. I and mean, Rick, that guy was yeah, coming he, up. He was, yeah. he was already there. They're still doing McTwist. Him and Terry are going to see who could McTwist the latest in life. Right? Like, <laughs> they're turning 50 in a couple of years. They're, they're going to be doing f McTwists at 50. Good on them. Yeah. It's epic. It's great for the sport. I know they could both do them. Yeah. I mean, those guys are insane. They're both insane. Yeah. They're both insane. And, and they're both great people, in yes, my opinion. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, totally agree. I should say it on Mike because last season, I kind of dug into the Terrier getting canceled idea. And I found out what the other side 
was about, right? It's kids. When you're a kid and you hear, you know, when we were kids and we'd hear our grandparents talk about black people, we'd be like, whoa, you can't talk like that. Right. That fucking sucks to hear that. And kids now, you can't talk like that about gay people. It's not, it's not okay to make a gay joke. It just doesn't happen. You know what I mean? Right, right. And the industry was rallying around in every different way. And you can watch media about whatever side you want. So you can get all the information where you're like, yeah, fuck, fuck the kids. It's Terrier. You don't want to fucking mess with the legacy of this guy. He's the most iconic. He's the only one to do what he did in that era. And nobody since has like repeated that. You know what I mean? Nobody ever will. I mean, it take going back to the Olympics where sports goes to die. Yes. He was the clear gold yes. medal winner in that. Absolutely. Thing. Sorry, yeah. Todd. <laughs> right, right, right. I don't think Todd, I think Todd choked. Though. Yeah, no, he didn't win. He got 10th place, I think. I don't even know. <laughs> but he de- uh, maybe he podiumed on the first one in 98, like silver if he did. I was there. I don't or remember. Gold. Yeah, yeah. He didn't get gold for sure. John no, he didn't Simmons. get gold. But yeah. regardless is like, yeah, it, it, turn your hands down. And he boycotted the Olympics. So did. And he boycotted it for the same purpose of what I stated. Yes. The Olympics are where sports go to die. Yes. And he articulated that over the next 20 years, and he was completely right. The last thing I want to say about the Terrier thing is that seeing the one side, like, yeah, don't speak like that. I get it. Seeing the other side is he's not homophobic. So to define... If you think, if your definition of a homophobe is Terry Hawkinson, you're not right. You're, you're actually doing a disservice. He's not out there actively no. trying to stop people from being gay or saying things that are really like, it, but he did make a homophobic tweet that was heard around the world in poor timing. He could have apologized and said, ah, fuck, you know what? I'm old or whatever. And I think it would have been gone, but it lingered. He's Norwegian. And he's Norwegian. And he's always been, he'll take the piss out of anybody. Yeah. Once you get to know him, he's taking the piss out of you. That's the way, you know, and it's in fun, but it's also like, Terry, you know, there's like a power imbalance here. You're like the best fucking snowboarder that's ever lived. And I'm a podcaster. That's a huge fan. So like, I'm not going to rib you back. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's no reason to. Yeah. 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 I, you know, I know his... I admire the Norwegians, you know, it's funny. I have a lot of Swede friends and they're like, you know, they'll, they'll quake things like to, uh, uh, the Norwegians like, Oh, it's like a 78 year old Norwegian, you know, <laughs> woman, grandma, <Sure. laughs> because they're just, they're, they just go and, yes. and they, they have a heart of gold in the sense of pushing forward. Rad, rad. We just met some Swedes on Hill. Abe, I want to shout out Abe and, and Theo, his brother. They made a, a film with uh, Ingmar Bachman. Oh, cool. And Ingmar's back yeah. and he's got the same style and so much fun. Unbelievable. S- some the of my best are photos amazing. are of Ingmar Bachman up oh, here. You in shot some photos, yeah. right? I used to shoot quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. an era where you shot. Well, here you are at camp. You've, you've got everybody in a, I had to be there anyway. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You're inviting yeah. all these people out. Why, why not shoot them? Yeah. And I could sell those photos to mostly Japan, but it felt very um, disorganized in 91 for, for a camper. Like, cause I had gone to camp where it was like, you got a counselor, they're sleeping in a bunk room with you. You've got a song that you've made up about your bunk or whatever. Yeah. And it's very structured. You wake up in the morning, you got to do the cold dip, then you go to breakfast and then you go to archery. I got to camp and I was like, they were like, pick a bed. You know what I mean? Well, I, what? And, then, yeah. <laughs> and there was just coaches all over the place. Holy shit. There's Ray and Olam. You know, it was a year that uh, uh, you had Ray, Bertrand. Ray and Bertrand Denebard. And, and, and uh, Camille yeah. Brichet. Camille oh, Brichet. Fuck, what what was that other guy? Yeah, those guys are incredible. It was just, they were standing out. You could see like, holy shit, this, this stuff is way harder now than it was last year. These guys are going way bigger better tricks, Pushing better it. style. Pushing it. Yeah. yeah. It actually was kind of a changing of the guard because Downey was there, Delaney was there, and it, you're watching those guys going, okay, they're not doing what these Euros are doing. Not even close. The Euros are blasting. Yeah. They've got edge control. You know, put like forward lean on my high backs. I'm like, I can't 
straight my legs now he's like I'm yeah exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> that's the way i rode the whole time full full camp forward oh wow and cool. then added things too depending on how icy it was really yeah, yeah. so i put in rubber i duct tape in rubber things oh wow you know things yeah. that were there but yeah yeah no i remember those guys i love those guys we had so much fun with them how many campers would have been at a session back at that time 50 or something 30 so or... 91 we we're probably f- it depends on what session you know we had i think we had eight sessions in the summertime yeah we were full up there wasn't a bed anywhere yeah, so full up is in that lodge fred meyer's lodge was probably 60 yeah that makes sense so 60 and then there was years where in sessions where we had 84 we put people in tents outside oh wow that's but amazing i concur with you that organization at first is like you know it was Still trying to figure it out. It couldn't be like the dumb summer camp that I went to before. Like, it wouldn't have made sense. The, because the the pros were there as coaches, but also to, like, get better themselves. Yeah. And then they're also there with a bunch of pros from around the world, each other pushing each other. And, the, you know, there were certain people that really lent themselves to being coaches, yep. you know? Yeah. Like, Pappas was awesome. Nordwall, unbelievable. He, he was awesome. Yeah, awesome he's a good at, guy at camp. just so much fun and uh th- that was a couple of years later came back and you know begged my way into being a digger and then i was like oh god i don't want to be a digger i want to be a coach but i'm no good so <laughs> i don't know what to do here <laughs> those digger jobs wow yeah diggers are you know the good diggers I that, used to be one. Yeah, that is a that is. I used to go up and cut the vert into the wall, and then yeah. do the tranny while everybody else is messing things up, and do both walls. Yeah, and be way ahead of everybody. Wow, I had somewhere to go. I was motivated things yes. to do. You were motivated your whole career. There was some fire under your ass. Where did that come from? Uh, I think it's because I'm partially Norwegian. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. You know, I. I I, I grew up that way. So, I mean, at a young age, you know, by, by the age of really eight, I, I started working. By the age of 12, I was working 25 hours a week. Yeah. By the age of 13, I was working 40 to 60 hours Jesus. a week. And, and, you know, saving money. I had more were money. Were you a I, skater with these guys? Like, were, did you do the downhill slalom stuff when no, that was I didn't happening? do that with the Pappas Bros no. and stuff like that. No. Right. Now, I, I would have probably had I known about it. Yeah, because I know you were adjacent to Pappas's buddy. <laughs> this is going to, this could either go really good or really bad. And home. Shane. Shane and home. Oh, Shane and home. Yeah. <laughs> and I know that you got in some trouble with Shane early on. And I thought maybe that might have motivated you to just get your act together and fucking. Yeah. 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 And clean. Yeah. Go out and do some good for, for humanity. Yes. Pretty much, you know, because so that, that was that was a path that you could have taken that would have gone at another direction, obviously. right? Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Shane's a, like punk kid at heart and just a wild man by all accounts he's a wild man yeah yeah thankfully i didn't i wasn't around that guy for very long well he's but he's it, done well for himself he's actually like a very respected tattoo artist he's he really? a historian on tattoo guns and stuff he's been in punk bands that you know are successful punk bands and he did a stint in jail and he got out and he cleaned up and he's he's one of those motivational guys that's Pappas adjacent where you look at the life and you go, they pulled it off somehow. They went all the way and, and pulled it off. Nice. Yeah. Well, that's good to hear. He's doing well. Yeah. Sick, sick. Yeah. So Um, was that, I mean, you were a bit of a badass by all accounts. Those would, you know, those guys at that time. Yeah. You know, I, I got sucked in that punk rock deal there for a little while Yeah, in Boulder. And then I just left. That's what I did. Yeah. I basically moved out of Boulder and moved to Newport, Oregon. Yeah. School, like school age, like go to college, get the fuck out of your hometown. No, no, no. It was in high school. That was even high school. Yeah. And I came out here and lived by myself. And then I got my brother came out and lived with me for a while. Yeah. And and then my mom and dad came out and lived. Holy so, shit. So yeah, I was just like exit Boulder. Yeah. Yeah. Just go do something different. Yeah. And that puts you on this path. Yeah. Were you skating before you snowboarded? It sounds like no. Yeah, I was skating before I snowboarded. Kryptonics was right 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 up the way. Yes. So we used to dig in their in their garbage cans and <laughs> grab their wheels and sell wheels, you know? Yeah. 
And uh, right pretty close to them, Hanson Ski Boots was there too. So we used to grab their ski boots, make ski boots, and sell that stuff. Oh, wow. Yeah, so do the, do the same with the two. Ah. But most of my skating back then, and, you know, in Boulder, we – I like vert ramps. Got it. Okay. And I'm yeah. really into vert ramps. And, yep. and then I like hauling ass going downhill and stuff like that. Sure. Um, so there wasn't a whole lot of opportunity. And I was more into rock climbing. And, and back then, I guess you'd call it mountain biking. Right. Like, I really liked enjoy and still to this day, mountain biking. So sick. Yeah. 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 I'm picking up friends in a little bit. We're coming up here to go mountain bike for I'm three days. I'm freaking believable. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and you okay? So the Wendell Camp is legendary. You know, people go back and forth. High Cascade, Wendell's like there was a friendly rivalry there. There was I remember on Picture Day we throw snowballs at each other. Yeah, and you kind of you literally had a camp that you were. I'm in this camp. Um, how does a merger happen? Where does that like? How does we are camp become this huge thing? Yeah, so I had a daughter. And she's eight years old right now. And yeah. uh, so my deal is, and I've been trying to work with High Cascade to merge since probably 2004. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, hey, look, we're both up here in the mountain. We're yeah. side by side. Wouldn't we be better, this mountain be better served if we just worked together? Right. And we shared all this park up right. here. Sick. And I own a bunch yeah. of land yeah. to where you guys could come down there because as these things systems start coming into place you guys as rents are going to go up exponentially and eventually you guys are going to go to the wayside right because they were renting in govey right that's that, all, all that doing. stuff was and those ramps were just set up in the they've parking set up lot those ramps they... every every year break them down every year something that wendell's used to do too but when did you go to that concrete park because that was a game changer that compound did you build that no you, those cabins would have been there those cabins were there yeah yeah, yeah so so I bought the Ark property, which has 25 acres in, in, uh, in 20 or 1995. Holy shit. And I bought it, you know, I used to, in 1995, I used to rent places out for okay. the staff of camp, right. campers, and, and just for camp and camp yeah. uh, all together. And it was like 480,000. I bought that Ark property for 280,000. Oh, wow. So it was just like, okay, this is a wash. Yeah. And yeah. then, and then, and then it was like, you know, the next uh, two years later, um, the place where we are camp is located where Wendell started or, or continue to build out, um, that place went in bankruptcy court. So I just went down immediately and, yeah. and bought it. Sick. And yeah. so that was a game changer. That was right? a game changer. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Because then you're done. You're yeah. not. You're not wasting money, and yes. you're controlling your own destiny. Right. Right. And you know, my whole goal with Wendell is to, to begin with was I didn't want to be in Whistler. Right. I didn't want to be in government camp. Right. I wanted to be in the woods. In nature. In nature. Yeah. Where we could build things out. We could focus on the kids and really, Dude, really hunker down. As a testament to that, Steve Van Doren, obviously. Uh, the biggest big wig at Vans and the best guy, such a, such a bro. I agree. He chose not to stay at the pro riders house in Gubby. He wanted to stay in those cabins, uh, the, the tents, tents yeah. in the woods and that tent section right there. Like, I love what they've done with, with the idea of the, um, you know, the signature sessions made sense, mm -hmm. but when you do it with a company and they can bring all their guys down and everybody stay in those tents and and the fire the at night. Oh my God! You're at camp. That's the thing. You're at it's camp. It's different than when you're in Govey and you're staying at the Huckleberry. At that, then you're just and somewhere you're, weird. You're socializing yeah. over at the Chucks. And you're trying. Charlie's. Yeah, you're trying to get into the Rat Skeller back in the day. Now <laughs> you're on the patio at Charlie's. Yeah, it's it's not the same. It's not the same thing. The tents in the woods. I mean, when we were at camp first night, the campers were still there. And I mean, you've got kids on unicycles, kids on, on mountain bikes. Omar Hassan's there. One of the best skaters in the world is shredding with kids. There's guys on skis, snowboards. There's a big air airbag. There's trampolines everywhere. You got Steve Van Doren handed out stuff free to kids. Unfriggin' believable. They did like art shirts where the kids are painting on shirts yeah. and making dive, you know, tie-dyed bags. And then it's 11 o'clock. There, I think at nine o'clock there was like, it got quiet. Eleven o'clock, every light in the place just goes out. Yeah, and it's lights out. And, and as a guest of the camp, 
that thing that I was talking about in 91, where the fucking coaches are just all over the place. They're everywhere. They're just there. The, and you, they're, yeah. they're approachable. The, just, yes. Yes, exactly. Because <clears throat> you're eating with them. You're hanging out with them. The lights out thing was like, as a guest, we were like, oh, we got to be quiet now. We're not, nobody's going to get like belligerently drunk. Like this is a place of, there's a bunch of kids here. It's camp. Yeah. It's very respectable. And it was really such a rad experience to see it all these years later as like what it's evolved into. You had a huge, huge, huge hand in that. Oh yeah. Because that place, even when you started out, the little features on the way in, like that was feature. very unique. Mm -hmm. That wasn't, you're, you're not going to get that anywhere else. That's the idea. Concrete well, uh, features, the big yeah. idea is you have, you have lots of features out front Yep. and then you have all your, your exceptional skate stuff in the back. Yeah. And so for the people that want to skate yep. and learn to skate, uh, it's going to be a challenge for them unless you set up skate sections for them in, in the really exceptional stuff. And you yeah. do that. Yeah. But you, you give them the area to work outside. So rad. And that's what worked. I mean, my daughter's eight. She learned to skate during camps, her camp session this year. And she skates the whole park now. Oh, that's and amazing. by, by the yeah. third, fourth day of camp, she was out skating the exceptional stuff with everybody else. That's amazing. Which is fantastic. That's the progression you want to have happen at camp. It definitely yeah. happened for me. Like, I learned how to turn. I couldn't turn. That's why I was put in the beginner group. Right. I, I came from a place where you went straight at a jump. That's what I told Pappas to do. <laughs> <laughs> and Norty, it's like you gotta you gotta drill it down what they know and then place it into where where it needs to be. It was so good, dude. Yeah, it was so, it was so life changing, and the elements of camp that were that were life changing was the camaraderie of the of the community, and outdoors that. was really big. The fact that it was in the outdoors, that you weren't in an urban setting, you weren't, you know the hotel rooms at whistler and people kind of moving around and doing whistler stuff for sure camp there probably was amazing too oh yeah but being in nature like with the mountain bikes and and just everything yeah it was there's something to be said epic. about being in nature and, and like the way i see it is i've been blessed and i've been you know I've, I've lived within nature up in alaska where there's nothing else around for a long period of time wow and you get these senses back Yes. And you get these senses to where you don't see something coming behind you, but you know it's coming behind you. Or you got a boat coming in to drop off supplies or pick your staff up, and you can't see it for miles and miles in right. front of you, but you know it's coming, so you pack up the whole camp. And so those senses equate into this short period of time where kids are in camp in, in the woods with pros and all kinds of activities, some fun, some not so fun, some re unique, and, yep. and some, you know, just crazy um <laughs> and that's the way to do it and those senses of those people you see the change over you know the third day fourth day fifth day sixth day of where the camaraderie comes into play yeah and then that camaraderie and that stoke of of being this little community goes up to the hill and further pushes everybody the social and signaling of the people who are pros taking care of the the generation that's just learning right like that that like you said your daughter's skating the the best stuff day three day four mm -hmm. and she's seen people who are incredibly uh, you know talented pros skating the same spot the the feeling is really of inclusion it's dope yeah yeah. Yeah. It's and, it, and it was all the way since 91. Yes. That was the whole idea. Yeah. I was, I was not going to continue to run camps if I was going to be stuck in a town. Right. That right. was just, this won't make sense for me. Also the coaching thing that's going on now. So two things I'd love to talk about about now, because you've seen every generation of snowboarding, mm -hmm. you know, the coaching thing, like parents that are like, oh shit, you know, this coach approach us, saw you snowboarding at the local resort and, and said, that we should put you in a program where we pay to develop your skills. That wasn't what camp felt like at the time. It felt like you can, it was like French immersion or something, going somewhere and speaking the language. You can go and ride with the pros and see what they're doing. And, and then it, it's catered to your desire. If you want to be a competitive pro, you can, you know, get connected with the coach and they'll go through it with you day after day. Whereas we came out going like, we're already good and we just want to ride this epic stuff. 
And we did that successfully. Yeah. And it was fun. That still happens to this day. Yeah. I mean, I coached a little bit this early this summer. It's still, oh, wow. It's still the same thing. It's still the same thing. Yeah. What, and that leads me to the second thing is that kids are on phones. How did phones change camp? Was it like a slow trickle? Was it, did you ever have to be like, look, fucking no phones? Yeah. So we've gone through the testing <clears throat> side of things of no phones and phones. Yes. And uh, there's really no right answer there. Where we've settled right now is if something happens, we immediately, a coach, a counselor, a, any kind of staff member immediately lets the front office know and the front office calls the parents. Because right. if they don't, the kids are going to call them. Yeah. So that, yeah, that would be a big deal. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. so those phone things uh, become a hindrance with some kids. You know, some kids get tired. Yeah. And so when they get tired and their moms are like frying them on something, they're going to say something that's not true. Oh, and wow. so then you're dealing with something with a parent that's, you know, yeah. 3,000 miles away. Right. And angry. What are you doing with my kid? <laughs> and angry. And, and, and yeah. Yeah. you're trying yeah. to decipher and imagine. break down exactly mm. what's going right. on. Right. I was thinking more from an attention point of view. Like you got a coach that's like, okay, we're team we're going to work on turning in the morning and and then looks at the kids and everybody's playing video games and then it's like it's time to go and the kids like i don't even really want to i feel like that today. stoke is still there in, in the kids good you know in it's not to say what you just explained yeah doesn't happen yeah i imagine yeah. it does sure, sure sure um and a lot of times i feel like that's the coach i didn't see any kids on their phones at the th i like but i, I maybe feel like I that stoke's still there because the kids yeah. are still trapped i mean they're they're dying to go do things. Good. And, you know, some of the things that I was most encouraged about with the kids that I taught this this summer is is that they were they were starving for information. Rad. Starving to learn how to do this. And, and you so. know, and then you would actually add another element to it. And they're like, oh, my God. Yeah. Yes, let's do it. Oh, that's so fun. So it hasn't yeah. – it's changed, but it hasn't changed as much as one would think. Right. You know, the biggest problem with cell phones that I see for generationally – is that they consume a good part of our livelihoods and so much so that kids don't go skiing and snowboarding or, right. or skateboarding. Numbers as much are as down and all, all across all sports and participation. Yeah. Cause they're sitting around on their, their games or playing games on their cell phones or the, texting. The games are more engaging. And also like once you get into the thing where you're, you're not having a perfect run on a phone, you just reset. But there's no reset in real life. Right. So you got to bail. And like a lot of and, kids and don't know how to. You might not be to... really good at it. Right, right. And you can't hide in a closet and learn no, how to be really good exactly. at it. Exactly. You can't get your parents' credit card to buy the coins to up your weapons. It's, you're, you're, you have to do the work. Yeah. You know, I travel still quite a bit and I see, uh, you know, in parts of the country, I see a lack of participation from kids. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's, uh, you know, it's. It's concerning. It's a societal problem. It's that a we're societal problem. For I mean, sure. us, you know, the the mean age of people skiing and snowboarding is probably thirty something. <laughs> you're probably uh, right. Might even be forty. Jesus, <laughs> could you imagine? Yeah, no, you're right. It's it's not a it's not a super youthful sport. There, you know, up in Vancouver, there's a lot of kids doing it. It's cool to see the new generation uh, take it on and own it in their own way. It's, and it, that's, that's one of those inspiring. regions where, I mean, yeah. you guys are inherently living in the outdoors, much like here. Yeah. It's an important part of, that's why I moved across the country. I moved across the country because I went to your camp and I saw what it was to immerse yourself in the outdoors for your every day walking around to be in a forest is, you know, versus a urban setting or I grew up in Sudbury, Ontario. It was where they trained for the moon landing because the mining had burned away all the trees and plants and everything. Like it was a dismal ass place. And, <laughs> and as soon as I saw Oregon, I was like, I'm fucking moving here. Nice. Uh, I mean, it's crazy for me. I mean, here it is mid July and I, I went whitewater rafting like four days, three days ago. You know, we went skinning yesterday. We went golfing and, and then we snowboarded. <laughs> you know, and it's like we went to the coast and we went boogie boarding. 
with nice. kids. So, nice. Which I have boogie boarded in like 25 years. Were you a surfer in there for I, a bit? I, I was going to surf, but the kids wanted me to boogie board. Yeah, of course. So they're like, no, you're going to boogie board. So I actually had my surfboard and everything. Yeah, yeah. I had to go rip fins <laughs> in a boogie board. <laughs> but, you know, that's part of it. It's fun. It's so fun. So and yeah. I'm, I'm good with it. Yeah. I, I had a great time. But, you know, it's like all that in this little area. You yeah. know, all the while, I feel like I play golf almost every day. I, th- I feel like you said that to me on that chairlift all those years ago. That would have been ni- it's winter of 91 that you did that demo. And I went the summer of 91. Right? Because 91 is when you're on Checker Pig. That's yeah, that 91. La- yeah. Latter part of 91. So I exactly. guess it was summer. Yeah. Because yeah, uh, Dorfman shut down Sims. Yep. Well, he just went bankrupt, is what he did. Wow! So you were on the team right till it, right till the end. Yeah. So Tom was like, "Hey, Tim, I want you to stay on Sims. Yes. We're gonna work this out." Yep. And I was like, "Tom, I, I, I need money, <laughs> money to travel. Money. Yeah. What's what's your guarantee of me traveling? You know? Right. And so he didn't really have a guarantee. And then it was all these other things coming in. And Checker Pig offered something that really was enlightening enlightening especially because i don't even know if i said that right but the mountain bike side of things (laughs) and i checked out their mountain bikes i was like wow these guys are legit and everything was being made in a bmw factory and i was just like okay so we have some options here and they had a really good builder there um and we were working on things it was like yeah there's a possibility here the boards rode well the boards were were fine the name sucked shit. The name sucked. But on, on bikes, somehow it kind of worked too, right? Like bikes, it didn't seem like checker pig bikes. I was like, sure, whatever. But it was the same thing that happened to them. They went bankrupt. Yeah. What a bummer. And that was less than a year. But maybe. was that good money? So like, did you make good money while you were riding for them? Or was it better just the bikes and camp and all that sort of thing? The, the bikes ended up being what they needed to pay, what they were supposed to pay me. And so yeah. that was pretty much it. So, oh, so I, they kind of paid you in bikes instead of being in, in actual cash in your pocket. Yeah, I got something out of it. Yeah. I had some cash out in my pocket. And, yeah. You know, I got good, to run around good. a little little bit. But yeah. after that, I was just like, you know what? I started a glove business over in Japan. I was like, fuck this. I'll what just, gloves did you do? Windell's gloves. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You would sell them at camp and everybody had them. It meant yeah. that you went to camp. It was yeah. sick. Yeah. 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 And so it was like, uh, yeah. So the Wendell glove thing, and that that went great, gun. So I was just like, I'll just self finance myself. Yeah, I'm gonna yeah. buy a Terrier board. Yeah. <laughs> you did? You bought a Terrier? <laughs> I love it. So I much. bought it. <laughs> That's great. And I competed on that thing. That's incredible. Yeah. You know, Jacoby bought the board that he competed on the Olympics with from his local shop. Did he really? Yeah, he just looked and went, okay, these hot boards look really good compared to what i'm riding they were good too yeah way. yeah they were and so he bought one <laughs> retail yeah <laughs> he competed on it and and qualified for the olympics on a board he bought that's awesome it's nuts to me so see, you're saying the same thing you're like oh, i've always wanted one of these terrier boards no, i've ridden it yeah. i was like yeah. this is great board yeah which era board was that the sword so or it the was the one, one that had the knife on it yep yeah 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 sword board yeah sword Sit. board did you keep it you know, I a lot gave of it to now. a friend, yeah. and I did, never got it back. Uh, I get it. I wish yeah. I would have kept it. Yeah, yeah. Those days, it was kind of, you're always looking at the future. You're not thinking, oh, yeah, this board's going to be worth two grand one day. I wish I would have looked at it that way, because yeah. I had a snowboard <laughs> shop in Durango, Colorado. Oh, wow. I had boards from all over the place. Yeah. Like, I had, I'd go to Europe, and they'd hand me boards, because everybody wanted me to ride for them, you know? Right. And so I was like, well... I'll check it out. Do I have to give it back? No, 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 no. <laughs> That's so So bad. I go take them and put them in my rental shop and yeah. rent them out. It's so awesome talking to you all these years later. And I'm still a fan. I got nervous to come down and, and see you because I'm like, this is fucking Tim Wendell. You've given so much to the industry with just your vision for where it should go and how to do it. I think a lot of that was organic. Like you, you build the camp and then you see... Oh, you know what? We let the pros come and ride, right? We don't charge them. Sure. You want to eat the sandwiches? Eat the sandwiches. Yeah. Um, we invite the media. Yeah. And then the media shoots all this shit. We, we make sure we work with the best mountain. And Timberline just builds all these features that you're like, all right, give it a shot. People get the media, get the shots. The kids see it. It's in every movie. MacDog had huge huge timberline 
influence in the early days. The progression happens. It's a win-win for absolutely everybody. It's a win-win for the ski industry as a whole. <laughs> yeah, you know, because totally. back then there's no parks right anywhere, so they could look Nowhere. at what we're doing and go, "Hey, okay, so these guys aren't having that many injuries," you know. Right, <clears throat> right. You guys were the guinea pigs. We would put together yeah. little. I'd put together little reports. This is our injuries. This is where the people went. Wow. You know, this is how many kids we put through, and yeah, yeah, it was one of those things. And then it was eventually, you know, I hate to say it on there, but I think it's worthy of saying. Come '98 is like, all right. These snowboard only parks make no fucking sense, and they're not going to stick around if it's snowboard only. Segregation, right? Yeah, right. segregation. It is hard to fucking, you know. I've talked about it with all the guests that I've interviewed down here. Kids ski and snowboard now. I met like someone at camp. I was like, "That's cool. What do you do? Ski or snowboard?" And they're like, "Both." And I was like, "What? How?" Now, snowboarding opens your eyes, allows you to read the slopes better. Totally. Opens your eyes to making it more fun. Skiing makes you a better snowboarder. Unreal. It's amazing. Yeah. So you were the first camp that allowed those like gnarly freestyle skiers to join in and hit the the same parks, like you were saying. Yeah, we started allowing them to come in from the get-go. Like the first guy that was building pipes for us Yeah. with me. And, and building snowboard half pipes was Tom Riggins. And Tom Riggins was those figure eight skier oh, wow. winning figure eight co- contests. And wow. he just come out just to hang out and yeah. uh, be a part of camp. And so he was digging there. So we had skiers from the get-go. Right from the get-go. Yeah. And then it really started picking up in 94. And by 96, I mean, we had, even 95, we had Poor Boy Productions, which is the equivalent of Mac Dog and a, on the snowboard side of things. And they filmed everything up there for the wow. next, like, five, six It was six that years. early on. Yeah. I, I had no idea. And then I want to say I allowed the skiers to come in in 98, and everybody's like, okay, your camp's done. Right. And my camp just went boom. Wow. Like an extra wow. explosion. Yeah, because there was that, uh, that free skiing catching up to snowboarding with the coolness factor. I think it it caught up and like in a lot of ways for a few years there the kids that caught my attention of style yeah. like like and that, that's one of the things I want to say about camp was that going to camp this week reminded me that when I was 16 what I was doing at camp was I was looking at what you guys were wearing mm-hmm. the way you carried yourselves the sponsors you had the way you snowboarded like I was looking for signaling how do I signal to the world that this is what i am i'm a snowboarder right and that was a big part of it like wearing a hat backwards or not wearing a hat at all having long hair or dyeing your hair or some at the year that i was there kids were like giving themselves dreads and they like, put gum in their hair to you know <laughs> what i mean like beeswax works like it was a, sig- a huge signaling of the community of how do we want to present ourselves out there in the world yeah right and it's it's still that i still see that and so There was a point coming to Hood where the skiers were the ones that I was quietly being like, they're taking over right now. It's their time again. Like skiing from before us, their image was horrifying. Oh, it was dying. It was terrible. Skiing was waning. Glenn Plake and Scott Schmidt that people often mention where they were doing it for sure, but their image was more snowboarding than... You know, as as much snowboarding as a snowboarder. They were anti-ski as well. Definitely. Glenn Plake, I mean, yeah, he's full punk rock. Full punk still to this day. S- still yeah. to this day. Yeah. He's still yeah. skiing, yes. which is fantastic. Yes. So is Scott. Yes. I don't know. I haven't kept in contact with Scott, though. Right. Unfortunately. Well, he's still in the North Face. I think he's the longest held athlete on the North Face. If I'm not r- wrong about that, I'm probably well deserved. Out. Yeah, yeah, and a really good guy, right? Yeah, like so, super good guy. Yeah. So my anti skiing thing, it is segregation. It is, it is silly. It was segregation, and, and it yeah. got really bad between snowboarders it got really against bad. the skiers. And the skiers it was got like, really bad. Dude, like loved, you said, we '98, we're like Windells is dead. They're the like, you know, <laughs> skiers in there. Like High Cascade is is the place, and they probably got a boost from that for sure. Oh, High yeah. Cascade being they used it in a, as, as their advertising. We're the only snowboard only camp or whatever. They use it in their advertising. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. skiers, skiers. Marks mess up the the, the run ins to jumps yeah. or rails or whatever. It was. Sounds like the eighties. And I would call funny. those guys up and go, "Really? Right? You guys are desperate." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you were forward thinking on that, and I remember I called you and, and was asking you about like, 
whoa, you're 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 gonna go to skiers? Oh no, I called you when it went ski only because when oh yeah when everything happened, I was like, how do you feel about having your name on like a ski only thing? You're like, I skied and you had no animosity towards skiing, so I w- it was moot. You're like, dude, I don't. Well, you know, when I used to compete in a World Cup, I'd go over to Europe and you know you spend a month and a half over there and on snow virtually year round yeah you know um is that i would go skiing everybody wow. go freaking train oh i'm gonna go train right. i'm gonna go learn a new trick i'm like right. i'm gonna go to france and ski and have fun yeah 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 change it up you know and, and that yes. way that's like a mindset change for me it's not that i did i love snowboarding i love i love snowboarding and yes i mean if you lived where i lived which is amazing like this winter was insane right i mean we had you know april we got 11 feet of snow so that's <laughs> every day in april was a powder day oh wow you know? that's and, awesome and then in december and early january or january i mean it was just insane like how good the powder was it's incredible you know it's like we talk about utah pow keep talking about utah pow that's all i gotta say <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, yeah i mean i drive six hours to go ride hood in the summer black home's an hour and a half away yeah. like this is, place is up. Is Black Home still open in the summer? There was a camp on Whistler this year that Momentum Camp that I heard you had to be a camper to go on the. I'm on the happy snow. to hear Momentum so still going. Yeah, so there's. I don't think there was any public up there. Okay. So and Ken closed camp maybe four years ago, mm-hmm. and he, he was saying, you know, the the snow depths just aren't there anymore. Yeah. Like the, the amount of snow they need to push around to make the things they want, it wasn't there. And it was super disappointing, and it was yeah, it was heartbreaking. Yeah, for sure. yeah, it's sad. Palmer, you've you've got forty years of data, thirty years of data on the on the snowfield. It's fluctuating, right? Like, are we? Is it is it getting less over time? Like, were there better years in the beginning? Or I mean, this is this summer is as good as it gets. This is as good. This as is it high gets. tide. Yeah, for yeah. lack of a better word. Hell yeah, this is really good. You know, we go. It, it, there's the ebb and flows and the patterns, you know, the last time I feel like the snow is this good was 2010. Okay. And I have pictures of 2010 looking from the top of my park, yeah. which is at the bottom of the mile or, or Palmer snowfield yeah. and looking a mile and a half to two miles down a park. The yeah. Whole way. Yeah. And we built off jump after jump, oh, after jump after that. rail. And it was yeah. insane. And that's one run. run. Yeah. Park in the summertime. Yeah. In July, in July, this time of year. Yes. So same same snow depth yeah you know in 2009 was good but 10 was unbelievable just so good yeah Rad. Rad. yeah and we rode Which we rode was year, it, we rode year round was that when the olympics were in vancouver 2010 olympics yeah it was the worst year for yeah, us yeah you oh guys oh my god you it was, guys, there was nothing yeah you guys yeah. had no snow a lot of storms though so like if those you know at the higher elevation you're just you getting know, hammered that's with snow. weird too cuz i guess what you your guys is Jetstream is Baker up? Yeah, probably. Yeah. I mean, sometimes we get the same storms as Tahoe. And a lot of times we get the same storms as here, right? Like we had the same year this year, like lots of snow, a lull, lots of snow, seven weeks of sun. So, and then I wonder if it's yeah. 2009 was the last big year. Could've I could been. be wrong. It could have been. Yeah. Tw- no, I, th- I think it was really rainy. And Whistler had a really good year that year. I'm just talking about grouse and oh, you're talking about the lower area. area. Okay, yeah. so that could probably yeah. be it. So it yeah. was 2010. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, that's dope. Yeah. So I mean, that's 12 years ago. It was the second year of our academy. So yeah, you know. So, so what's the academy compared to the camps? Oh, that's a good question. So the academy is where kids go to. We we predominantly take high school. Yeah. And the academy is from kids from all over the world. Right. Uh, they could. We got four respected sports that we work in, which is skiing, snowboarding, mountain biking, skateboarding. Um, the kids live on campus, Rad. so they're 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 basically that's their home uh, throughout their semesters. We have three semesters a year. Um, they work. Our, our philosophy is the, is is a- academics and athletics. Rad. So if they keep their grades up, which is pretty easy to do in this yeah. in the environment there, um, they travel. And so the idea is to get them out traveling. Wow. And go experience other places and and be a part of the learn more about the community. Go to places like, you know, vans or, you know, 
in Southern California, go visit Oakley, go visit some of those wow. those areas, as well as go hit some of those ski areas up, you know? Shit, yeah. Um, in some cases, the kids like to compete. Yeah. And uh, so we, we cater to that as well. And so we basically work with them. Coaching. So five, six, yeah. five, yeah, it's coaching and it's coaching, you know, for months. Yeah. Oh, and it's not wow. just coaching on hill. It's coaching off hill. So we do all kinds of balance stuff. All, we have dry slopes. We have airbags to launch into. Yeah. We have super tramps. We have Olympic tramps. Yeah. You know, we have the whole skateboard thing. And the, the community is such that it kind of meshes together. They all work together. Right. Is to really kind of get those people into doing just a little bit more than what they're accustomed to. And they, I, I heard that it's flipped if you're snow sports you're on hill in the morning when the snow's good, mm -hmm. academics in the afternoon, and the mountain bike guys and the skaters probably can do their academics in the morning, and then they're out all afternoon yeah. doing their sport. So you can use the same space for the whole day, yep. right, for teaching. Yep. That is brilliant. It's yeah, no great. skateboarders. I mean, they travel all over the place. If you're a snowboarder, you want to hop on a skate trip, you could go travel with those guys. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh man, that's uh, yeah. So you, you yeah. could you could balance between any of the sports. You that's want. incredible, and I think that's really a, a unique aspect. Hell yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. The academy to me seemed like oh, this is this is the next level. Yeah, it's good. I mean, we have a hundred percent graduation rate, a hundred percent acceptance rate in the colleges all over. Oh you know, wow, all over the world. That's sick. And some really really high powered colleges, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we got ABM, uh, a guy that was a uh, announcer in uh, the last Olympics here in, in Beijing. I mean, he's going to what's the prestigious college in, in, in most prestigious college in Canada? Uh, either Western, there's UBC and uh, UFT and uh, McGill. Maybe McGill. McGill. McGill's the one. It's McGill. In Montreal. Yeah, yeah in Montreal. Yeah, yeah he's badass. Quebec. He's French Canadian. Oh, yeah. You've seen a lot of French Canadians out here over the I've years. I've seen a ton <laughs> of French Canadians. I love it. Oh, they're, love it. they are tenacious. They're a hoot. And they are uber talented. Yeah. You know, some of the best snowboarders that have ever lived. Yeah, it's crazy French all Canadian. those small little ski stations they have out there and stuff like that. I've traveled through a lot of them. Yeah. And it's insane like how motivated they are. They're motivated. And yeah. I as I recall there's a one that I went to that was open 24 hours a day. Oh, I don't even know that. Well, I have to go there. I was like, <laughs> 24 yeah. hours a day. I'm freezing and it's 12 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> Is it does it get warmer at night? <laughs> <laughs> no, it does not. It stays cold for months. Yeah. Yeah, so like that boilerplate. I, I was talking to the, to Fridge. He's one of the you know competitive kids. He wears a backpack when he's riding. He's got a gimmick. He's kind of Palmer esque in that. Is he? He's he's smart about it. He knows he's got like uh, something that unique about him. You know uh -oh. what's in the backpack? Nobody knows. He showed me. I can't tell anyone. It's epic. He's. I love this kid, and he was saying that riding ice for him is the only thing he really wants to ride because it's the only thing that's truly consistent. Corn, snow, slush, it, it changes from run to run. But if you're riding rock hard ice, you know what to expect every time. That's why those, those Quebec riders fucking kill it. Yeah, life's a mindset, man. Convince yeah. yourself. Yes. I had my daughter, you know, we, we live in a rainforest. I'm like, it's raining again today. I love rain. And, <laughs> yeah. and she's eight now. <laughs> yeah. And if I see something, it's like, God, I wish you'd stop raining. She'd go, Dad, I love rain. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's life. It's it, life. It's life. Yeah, it's a mindset. Yeah. But I guarantee you someday as I, as he gets older, yeah. he's going to want to ride powder. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> no question. He's a young kid. Yeah. He hasn't had those, you know, those... Uh, career ending injuries that make you question everything about the universe right <laughs> holy shit or maybe he has he has a flop like him. a fish maybe i have no idea yeah was there an injury that that pulled you away from it sounds like you you trickled out of it through from 91 through 95 you picked your contest you kept your name out there but you were building such a thing at at camp that why bother like why bother go after a, another cover shot or something well you never got a cover you had a back cover no, i had covers did you yeah hold on ism oh sick hand plant hand plant yeah on ISM. ism up sick. at whistler sick. actually nice from whistler who shot it who i want to say it? fran richards did all right yeah on yeah. a trip yeah. that's sick yeah 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 that's amazing 
Sorry about that. I, sh- I should. No, that's know. okay. And then I, I've uh, had several covers over in Japan. Yes. On Snow Style and Sick. Snowing. Yes. I feel like I've been on a cover in Italy, which that magazine didn't stick around very long. Yeah. So I've had a few covers. Oh, that's it. Hey, that's it. I, I've been in. I've been in a double spread in Penthouse magazine. <laughs> Come on. Come on. I've had double spreads in Thrasher several times. Awesome. So, awesome. I mean, that's Thrasher. Yeah. Thrasher. Fan- yeah, fantastic. Yeah, yes. Penthouse? Yeah. I don't know about that, but I'm going to claim it. <laughs> that's super sick. Dude. And then, you know, just being in all the magazines in Japan, yes. which I think there was 16 or 18 of them. I mean, it's just... You were during that very first wave of Japanese craziness yeah, about non Nonstop. Nonstop. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there'd be, there's, there's, there's magazines out there where I probably had 140 plus photos. Oh, wow. There there were there was a contingent of Japanese uh, coaches in '91 oh, that yeah. were up there. Yeah, we had Sura. We had yeah, we had a bunch of guys. Sura was actually coaching the Olympic skateboard team. Over oh in Japan. wow, that's so, so those rad. kids that won. You know, he's yeah. part of that. You got Shingo uh, Shingo Shiatani again coaching those skateboarders that were in the Olympics. Epic. Won. Epic. Which is crazy to yeah. think of. Yes. And they're like in charge of that whole thing. I mean, Sura is who was here. He's the big Japanese guy. Um, yeah. I mean, it's crazy how good those guys are. And just like looking, it makes me proud to to look back and go, wow, those guys used to work for me. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. You've had so many it's, amazing dudes over insane. the years. And then like you look at the Harper and Jewett thing. Oh, wow. All yeah. All the skateboard parks they're building everywhere and how they're in charge of like building out, you know, everything yeah. for the X Harper games. built that Great Wall of China Danny Wade jump yeah. thing. Yeah. 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 It's nuts. It's insane. Yeah. Yeah. And like people like that that have come through the coffers makes you really really proud of what's well, going I'm, on. Uh, you, and it's not just on it, it, within the respective sports. It's right. outside, you know? Well, I think one of the big things that you're touching on here is that you you took a, a leap of faith on snowboarding. You knew. It's a pretty sure bet. But business-wise, you know, that's inspiring. The number of companies that have started because of people from around the world being at Timberline saying, you know, we should build a better glove uh, how many board have launched out of yeah that? It's yeah un- remarkable right. how many have launched just at wendell's yeah back in the day how long did wendell's run independently how long has it been going since 88 till now it's 34 years 34 yeah. shit man yeah it stood the test of time that's respectable within the snowboard industry i thought when wendell's got bought by we are camp that you were just out of it that you had we didn't get the bought name. you know i, I guess i didn't fi- finish that whole conversation right i merged so my deal is i had an eight-year-old daughter yes. and you know i'm very very thankful for her unfortunately her mom i didn't realize had had some underlying issues going on and so i was like i need to be around for my daughter i see the first six years of a good kid's life is like building the foundation 100 for everything that that kid's going to be 100 in, in, in the future and so i was like okay the camp and the academy takes all my time and taking care of all the properties. I need to merge, yep. <clears throat> sell, yep. or just shut the doors. Oh, wow. And so I went on the campaign, found a, found a buyer, got right up to where, you know, he was going to put down the money. And I was just like, you know what? I don't feel right. You're just, I don't think you're going to be able to run this camp for very long. Right. I think you're going to shut it down. And I was at the same time pushing high cascade. And I knew... That if I kept pushing hard enough on Kevin, that I could get him to merge with me. And so I did. It finally happened. It, yeah. Because, so yeah. we basically swallowed those guys up and right. they came in and their deal, the deal was, is like, you know, the, I forget what he was. It's like, we want you to, you're going to work 60 days, like in the transition side of things. I was like, no, I'm going to pay attention to my daughter. Right. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do. Yeah. I'll be around with my yeah. daughter as yeah. much as needed. But yeah. my Hit daughter, my daughter's number questions. one and, yeah. And I'm peace out, pretty much. Yeah. And has that ha- that's how it's played out over the years? That's how it played out for the most part. And then we got into a financial situation. So we had the coming of two seemingly similar businesses yeah. that were distinctly different. Yeah, yeah, So yeah. High Cascade was situated up in government camp yep. since the beginning of time. Yeah. And they're used to having a skateboard park. Totally. And uh, doing some games. They had some great games and stuff like that. But letting the kids do their own thing. Mm-hmm. The entertainment is all the ski girls and guys and people walking through town and the pros. And oh, right, that, right. This and that. It's kind of what you made, you made it sound like in 91 at the uh, Son Village at yeah. Wendell's. Yeah. Um, and Wendell's was organized activities. 
So the idea was, is, you know, make off hill more fun than on hill. Yeah. How do we, how do we do that? You know? And so many contests, like kids come back and they could win stuff scavenger hunts the whole thing icebreakers yeah and you and you bring the brands and you say hey you want a bunch of kids wearing your shirts send us a bunch of shirts and we'll paint paint on the shirts or whatever we're gonna do yeah 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 yeah. continuous activities yes that encompass everybody all walks of life killer that's the idea and so that was the mindset so they didn't get that they knew how to run camp and they did yeah and they were successful yeah up in government camp and so they came down and and uh, started working on that stuff, and we had about four bad years there. And so oh, I wow. was, like, looking for things to do, and China was coming up. And so I went over and fig- figured out a deal in China that we could, you know, bring in some extra money. And we picked out five disciplines of uh, the Chinese Olympic teams. So I went over personally with uh, Mike Hanley, who runs our school. We actually picked out 122 athletes to fill the coffers of five different disciplines for the Chinese national team. Wow. And then we trained them. Yeah. Yeah. And it worked. And it worked. Yeah. They got medaled. They medaled. Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> there was several, I think there was three of them, three of them medaled. That's insane. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, insane. So that, yeah. So you were, you found yourself retired, but working. So I found myself working for probably a year and a half. And, and fortunately I had plenty of time with my daughter. So that was, that was the big underlying side of things. And, you know, I mean, my deal is when she's, when she's not in school or she's around, it's like, she's a hundred percent with me. Oh, that's dope. And so we just, yeah, we play. That's very respectable. Yeah. And it sounds like she's getting a good, a good feel for the outdoors and skateboarding. She already has a great deal for the outdoors. I mean, we're flying to Africa Oh. And we're flying into Johannesburg, and I'm buying all the camp and shit. Oh, wow. And renting it out. We're going to go camp for three weeks throughout all the national parks, not just in South Africa, but up in Zimbabwe and Mozambique. And we're, like, driving. <laughs> we're just going to camp Jeez, out. She's, get, she's got it. She already has it. And she's, you know, she's talented. Like, she's I, – I say this a lot to people. It's like she's got more talent than most – People that are twelve year old boys her age, <laughs> yeah, boys, yeah. yes, she's super talented. Yeah, there's a lot of progression. We've been talking about it in women's snowboarding, skateboarding, surfing. That it's fun to watch because there was a gap there, and it was a gap of support, right? Like, it was a gap of support, and you know, people kind of go buy bite in the negative energy. There's nothing there for me. It's like, what's there for you, right? <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, what, what, what's the old thing? Is like. What can what can you do for you? Right. Don't worry about everybody. Don't expect a, a handout. Right. You know, the entitlement side of things. But yeah, what can you do? I agree. There is a gap there, and you know, I feel like it's there are women that are coming on, but you know, in a lot of ways, I still see that you know, and I don't mean any disrespect to this, but I, if, I see a I see opportunity for my daughter. Yeah. And that's exactly what it is. Like when we we're talking about the natural selection, not you and I, but people in the world going. Well, you know, the women's wasn't as good as the men's. Like, yeah. If I was a woman right now, I'd be so excited because I've got a shot. Yes. If I can do a backflip and a 360 in the backcountry and land it and ride, I could fucking go to natural selection and become one of the best known women snowboarders in the world. Mm-hmm. That's an attainable goal. Mm-hmm. It's the progression hasn't gotten to where. You got to be able to start with a, an inverted cab five and stick it in powder and, yeah. and just go from there. Like it's for me, it's a positive. It's like it's going to get there. That's the way progression works. But as of right now, for women's competitive snowboarding in the backcountry, um, you know, it's hard. It's really, really hard to do. But I would be super motivated as, as a 10 year old girl seeing. You know, Robin Van Jin ripping it out there. Zoe Zynot just killing it. I'd be like, that is what I want to do. No, it's funny you say that because I, since my daughter was two years old, you know, is I work on her in speed yep. and, and and mobility through the trees yeah. and everything else. Yeah. And she goes faster than any of my friends. There you go. 
Yeah. Like she keeps almost right up on me on my t- tail, and I'm fast already. That's the and foundation. We, we jump from a snowboard. We jump to skis. We do the same thing. Rad. Conditions are shitty. We're yeah. fucking hauling ass. <laughs> I love and it. And it's shit. just to set her up for that. She yes. has no idea what I'm doing. Right. She just sees it as, I'm it's, having fun with that. It's the paint the fence thing <laughs> for karate. Kid. I'm not like, it's hey, like, we're yeah. training here to do this. It's right, like, right. Yeah, let's go have some fun on those skis. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> the snowboard. I think it's so fun. Tim, and when I say hauling ass, like hauling yeah. ass legitimately. I, I have to thank you, man. We're, we're at the end of my memory stick here. Okay. We've done an hour and a half. Oh, wow. That was quick. This is, it's, it's full circle for me. You gave me a lot without, it, in, without thinking intentionally, like I'm going to give this kid something. Uh, from my love of the outdoors, where I live in my life, the yes. podcast all came from a chairlift ride, you know, 31 years ago yeah in a small town in the middle of nowhere because you had that kind of passion for the sport thank you very much yeah you're welcome you're welcome i i just feel blessed with with everything you know it's like i love what i do yeah amazing cool thank you killer hey can you snap a photo of this real quick oh yeah we need the photo for sure i want to Effenrad shout outs this week to Tim and his daughter. They did go on that African safari and it looked like they had a blast. Extra special thanks to Trevor Graves this episode. Thank all of you for listening right to the end and be sure to come back next week for another episode of the Effenrad Snowboard Podcast presented by Vans and brought to you by SIA Productions.